Yeah. Okay. Right, I really don't like doing this over Zoom. It feels very strange. I'm not sure how many people are there listening, but welcome um, to this Foreign Policy Centre event. Um, we are here to talk about finding Britain's role in a changing world and defining the values that the UK should stand for and um, protecting its ability to defend them. A very timely discussion given the Chancellor's announcement yesterday about um, certainly the, the, the direction of travel for, for the next year or so and how that's going to impact on one of the core um, elements of UK foreign policy at least, which is its overseas aid budget. Um, here to discuss um, the topics, the issues, we've got three um, very eminent speakers. Um, we're going to be kicking things off with Tom Tugendhat, who, as I'm sure you're all aware, is the, um, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, and also um, an experienced um, expert in the field of foreign affairs and defence diplomacy, um, given his military background. Um, I remember first um, encountering him when he was uh, an assistant to the then Chief of the Defence Staff, um, General David Richards. That was quite a, a while back and he was very much interested in lawfare, I think, at the time. Um, we also have Dr Kate Ferguson. Um, she is the co-executive director of a charity called Protection, Protection Approaches, which is all about dealing with um, ending identity-based violence. Um, and so I'm sure we'll have a very interesting perspective on the kinds of um, issues that the UK should be defending and protecting um, in the world. And then last but not least, we have Benjamin Ward, who is the UK Director of Human Rights Watch. Again, another very important group that is all about defending um, important human rights. So very interesting to hear. Very, I will be very interested to hear what he has to say about um, all of these issues. But without further ado, I will hand over to Tom to kick things off with his views about Britain and uh, its place in the world. Thank you. Deborah, look, thank you very much indeed. Actually, you, you don't remember where we first met. We actually first met in Basra in 2003, just after I'd accidentally invaded Iraq. And uh, you were working, I can't remember who for at the time, but you were a journalist uh, down there. At the AFP, time. well, 2004, but yeah. There you are, I was a captain then, and, uh, and you probably met quite a lot of captains, so I can quite understand that you forgot, uh, you forgot meeting me. But there we go, it's nice to see you again. Look, um, this is a really important time for the UK. It's actually a really important time for the world because the world is in one of those moments of flux, one of those moments of transition, when if you like, the iron is hot, the iron is malleable, and before it cools, uh, we all need to see what we can do to shape it towards the values that we think matter. And it's hot and flexible and malleable for the very obvious reasons of uh, COVID, of course, which we all know about. And indeed, for those of us who live in Kent, uh, we've been talking about all day. And it's hot and malleable, of course, for other reasons too. One is uh, the changing position of China. I would say that the, not the rise of China so much as the reassertion of China, China having been a great power for most of the last 3,000 years, with a couple of hundred years exception just recently, but otherwise a great power for much longer than that. And of course, because of a major change that uh, we talk about all the time, but it's worth reminding us of, which is the change in technology, the globalization of information, the change in the nature of data. So those three areas really bring us to a point where the world in flux and the world uh, moment of transition brings in questions as to what the UK, and indeed others, but here we're talking about the UK, should do about uh, that change. And I would argue there's a few things we should be thinking about. Because if, if we set aside Brexit for a moment, and I know there's 30 odd days to go before we're finally out of uh, all the different arrangements, God help us. And uh, so we are uh, very often focused on our own interests. It's worth thinking about what Britain uh, has done for the world and why Britain's position in the world matters. And this is where I would say it's fundamentally to do with the rules. Now, what do the rules mean? Of course, for some people, it means the rule of law in a very simple sense. For other people, it means human rights in a very uh, more, much more evolved sense. But whatever it is, that principle of uh, having a system under which we operate is one that has been woven into the fabric of the international community over the past 
few hundred years, largely by British business and indeed by British military action through colonial uh, uh, invasion. It didn't start, of course, solely with Britain. It started, it emerged, as we all know, out of uh, the rights uh, of uh, the Enlightenment, the right, and pre before that, the rights that were expressed through the uh, Judeo-Christian traditions of most European countries. In many ways, it was first globalized, not fully globalized, but first globalized by the Dutch, uh, evolved by the British and the Spanish, and then really uh, became truly global, you could argue, in the latter period of the British uh, imperial experiment and into the early days of America and, of course, the wider spread of Europe. And so we've seen this internationalism certainly come to the fore in the last years of the Second World War and in the 70 or 80 years that follow it. And in that period, we've seen the real globalization of rules be embedded into an international system. We've seen the creation, of course, of the most obvious things like the UN uh, Charter, the UN General Assembly, and of course, various other organizations that sort of existed before, like the International Telecoms Union, which is about 150 years old, being brought into the UN system. So we've seen a whole series of channeling of this uh, rules-based system being pushed into uh, a wider form of globalization. Now that is where Britain has uh, played its part because everything from the Plimsoll line to uh, insurance contracts, to the idea of the Torrance Treaty, which although it came out of South Australia is based on uh, English legal concepts or at least the roots are based on English legal concepts. We've seen the UK being at the part of this rules-based system. We've seen Britain playing an absolute key part. In many ways, if you like, we are the wiring of the international uh, electrical circuit board. Now, what does that mean for us today? Well, we started off by talking about uh, the changes that we're seeing. We started off by talking about the changes of China, the changes of COVID and the changes of technology. And those changes and our role are intimately connected because actually the reality is that we are seeing these changes challenge the existing circuitry and challenge the systems that we uh, put in place. China is the most obvious one, so let's start there. Because if you look at the way that China is seeking to change the international order, what we're seeing is we're seeing not just a, uh, a systems upgrade, if you like, but a total systems reset. We're seeing the devolved nature of power that we've got used to in the last uh, 70, 80 years, where of course you have major powers, you have uh, hegemons like the United States, but the reality is that power is actually very diffuse. There are very few centers of total power. Even Washington isn't actually a center of financial power, it's a center of political power. Uh, if you look at European centers, you see them rather more diffuse even than the United States. And then you see other centers like Tokyo or indeed Canberra or Sydney, where you're seeing very different centers of power. And these different centers of power that communicate with each other and not just through the center have given a devolved and distributed network of strength to the world. Now, this has been hugely important because it means that when one area has struggled, others have uh, usually been uh, in a different position and, and been able to succeed. And there is no single point, no single node that can be interrupted. Now, China is trying to change that. For various reasons, a lot of them historic, China is through the Belt and Road Initiative and through other uh, debt mechanisms trying to change the way that power is distributed around the world and centralizing it instead of uh, through a distributed network, through a centralized one, rather more like a, a hub and spoke, where if you imagine a bicycle wheel with Beijing in the center and other countries on the rim and all of them having a binary relationship rather than an intertwined one. Now that is a real challenge to all of us, but it's particularly a challenge to the United Kingdom because the United Kingdom's role, as I say, has been in that wiring, in that circuitry of understanding, of underpinning that held up or holds up rather the international system. And so our system is built upon it, but it also offers to others uh, a, a way of building their own systems too and evolving uh, their own. Now, that doesn't mean, by the way, of course, that the UK is the only supporting architecture of that. It certainly isn't. The UK being the originator does not make us the only uh, important system within it. But it certainly does point to a role that we have. And what was interesting when we were doing our work in the Foreign Affairs Committee on the integrated review and the suggestions that we were looking for was how many people from the King of Jordan to the former president of Liberia called for the UK to 
remember its role and to help reset the circuitry that is going on around the world and the changes that are going on. Because if we're going to think about how data is shared, if we're going to think about how information is shared uh, through new global uh, companies, the like of which we've never seen before, where power is concentrated in such few hands compared to at any time in the past, if we're going to see the level of cooperation that we need to see in order not to constrain China, but to help uh, Chinese citizens achieve the success that we want them to achieve, but within a rules-based system, if we're going to see uh, a United States re-engaging uh, with an international community, this time perhaps in a way that's slightly less confrontational than it has been for a few years, then we're going to need Britain's voice alongside many others. Now, I've just touched on the United States, so I thought I'd move on a little bit there too, because we are seeing a reset, uh, not just in China, but also, of course, in America. It is interesting that what we're seeing out of the Biden White House on some, uh, well, not yet Biden White House, forgive me, out of the Biden uh, White House elect, uh, we're seeing uh, in many ways an echo of the Obama administration of four years ago, of course, but we're not seeing it repeating the same things as the Obama administration because of course the world has moved on. The Obama administration was uh, coming out of uh, the eras of the wars in the Middle East and then the struggles that we'd seen uh, under President Bush uh, at the time. What the Biden administration is doing is looking at a different world. And that's why what's so important is his statement that he's going to rejoin the Paris Accord, recognizing the challenge of climate change, reversing some of the uh, unilateralism of the Trump administration and working and looking certainly towards a more international uh, approach. Now, again, that's where Britain fits in, because Britain does have for various historic reasons, a strong network around the world. It has a very strong intertwined relationship with many, many countries. And this is where we offer, uh, in many ways, a unique relationship uh, that the United States and indeed many others can partner with us. Because if we get that relationship right, forgive me, that's just telling me the adjournment is over, so uh, we'll ignore that. Uh, if we get this relationship right, then we have an opportunity to reset the international order in a way that it hasn't happened for uh, about 20 years, probably since the end of the Cold War. Now, that means that this is an opportunity, as I say, while the metal is hot, to channel it into ways that we want to see for the future. So what do we want to see? Well, I would suggest that there are really a few things that we want to highlight. The first is quite obvious, it's climate change. You know, we speak a lot about climate change at the moment. We're talking about uh, carbon zero targets here in the UK and China is even China itself has even said that it's going to be carbon neutral by 2060. So, you know, we're looking at, sorry, they're getting away from the, uh, forgive me, they're getting away from the combustion engine, not carbon neutral, but getting away from the combustion engine by 2060. We're hearing countries making various different pledges of that nature. Now, this is a huge opportunity for all of us to change the way we work, but actually for countries like uh, the United Kingdom and the United States, and indeed most European countries, this is also an opportunity to set an agenda for change that defends the interests of our people and, of course, many others around the world. And the second is human rights, and I'm very pleased to see uh, Ben here because Human Rights Watch has done enormously good work around the world at various points. Uh, in defending human rights. And this is where we can reset that agenda too, because we're seeing violations of human rights, most obviously in parts of Western China, where the Uyghur Muslim population is being very severely brutalized, uh, in some cases with forced sterilizations, uh, mass imprisonments, and uh, the separation of uh, parents from children uh, uh, in order to achieve a form of cultural genocide uh, that is extremely concerning. And so standing up for human rights would sound like it's a important matter but a remote one actually it's much more than that it's not just a remote matter it's a matter that defends the interests of british people around the world because if we remember what foreign policy is fundamentally for the purpose of foreign foreign policy is the happiness and prosperity of the british people and that can only be achieved if we also support the prosperity and happiness of other peoples around the world and that means fighting for human rights now the last area I just wanted to touch on was uh, the pandemic. Of course, COVID has raised many challenges. And this feeds into the question that we've uh, been talking about today and yesterday that the Chancellor was speaking about when he made his decision on 0.7 for the aid budget. 
and indeed on the comprehensive spending review. Now, let's ignore the fact that all the Chancellor has done is moved £4 billion this year from aid into defence, uh, which is all that the 0.2% uh, move is. It's 0.2 off aid and 0.2 onto, so onto the MOD. Um, let's ignore that and let's look at why uh, our action in aid matters. Now, for those of us who are not wedded to targets as a form of government, uh, as a form of government spending, but actually want to see effect, we need to remember why what we're doing in aid matters. And it matters because fundamentally aid isn't, again, about protecting other people, although it does that. It's about protecting British people. When we spend on climate programmes, we are protecting ourselves. When we spend on vaccination programmes and on pandemic programmes in parts of the world, the global south, we're protecting ourselves. When we spend on uh, preventing the spread of Ebola or the education of girls, we are protecting ourselves because we are preventing the kind of dangers that we see uh, spreading around the world. Now, we know what migration and climate failure and indeed economic failure has done to parts of the Middle East. We've seen the effect of that uh, movement of people across Eastern Europe in 2015. The number of people who are potentially migrant from sub-Saharan Africa is 10 or maybe even 100 times that. And it's worth remembering that when we spend to invest in, our, uh, in helping others, we're very often actually protecting ourselves. So there you go. There's a quick run through on the various areas that I think uh, Britain should be working on. And I look forward to hearing from the others. Well, thank you so much. And I apologise. I should have said to everybody that if you had any questions for any of our speakers, then there is a little box at the bottom of your screen with a Q&A on it. And I think if you write in the question, then I will read it verbatim um, to, the, to whichever speaker you want to target it at. So we don't have any technical glitches of trying to get you to speak and things like that. Um, but thank you very much for that great um, kicking off um, of a discussion about Britain's policy. It is quite uh, um, maybe uh, dis disappointing that we've had such significant decisions being taken in terms of shaping the UK's global presence, including the merger of DFID into the Foreign Office and this um, change in the target of aid spending and defence spending without this overarching policy that we've been promised from the government in terms of the integrated review. However, it does mean we've still got time to shape it. So um, let's move to, uh, to Kate Ferguson um, and maybe you could give us a few five, just five minutes or so of what you think about um, Britain's, what Britain's uh, position should be um, in this changing world. Sure, thanks ever so much, um, Deborah. And um, thanks to the Foreign Policy Centre for having me join this really important um, and very timely debate. I think initially we were scheduled to talk the day after the U um, US presidential election. And I thought that that would mean that we had a lot to talk about, but coming this week, I think we perhaps have even more for the UK. Um, and thanks, Tom, for your, your really thoughtful remarks. There's, there's a lot to, to reflect on there. I thought I should pick up on, on Tom's point about how the UK can ensure that its voice is heard on the global stage and, and this opportunity to, to help reset the rules-based order in, in terms of burden sharing and in terms of human rights, both in light of um, the, the, the new Biden administration, um, but also many of the other changes to, to the global order and, and the era that, that we're living in. Like everyone here today, I, I have been really following closely and, and engaging with the Prime Minister's integrated review. Um, I, th I think I have probably written about 40,000 words in various evidence submissions, um, including to the Foreign Affairs Committee. So I'm sorry, Tom, if I overburdened your clerks with um, our evidence, um, and also as part of the submission that was made by the Foreign Policy Center. And, and the reason that so many of us in civil society have been engaging with this process amid a global pandemic when the communities that we work with and to support have been in even more need than they were before is because the integrated review promised to identify something that was really important for those of us that work um, in foreign policy on, on international issues, but also domestically. And it promised to identify current and emerging risks it promised to review the government's existing systems and capabilities. 
and it promised to set a strategy that would help the UK reach clear identifiable goals for 2030. Now, obviously, um, as, as Deborah has, has, has alluded to, there have been some pretty major announcements that have come in the last few months, weeks and days uh, that, that have rather preempted that, that uh, process. And I think it's just really important to remember why strategy is so important when we're talking about embedding values. Sometimes it can seem that values are something that is added um, superficially or, or on the top of. And I think I'm afraid that, that in recent years, um, or perhaps more longer, longer still, that's how human rights has really been seen in UK international policy. Not something that is embedded and integrated, but something that is promoted and added on. And, and I, I hope that what we can talk about today is, is how that disconnect can maybe be redressed. The Foreign Affairs Committee report on the integrated review, which I really recommend everyone to read if you haven't already, um, makes the, clear this point, you know, that the integrated um, review requires, as international policy requires, clarity, strategy and direction. And I'll, I'll just start with, with a quote from that, um, re, uh, that report, which says, you know, the UK can be a problem solving nation and one that opens opportunities for others. It can serve the British people and also the global good, but that demands an integrated strategy and deliberate prioritization. And that's what we all hoped that the integrated review would provide, clarity of values that would underpin the future of the UK and the world, and then a strategy of implementation. And, and so I hope that what is eventually presented in, in the new year will reflect some of those recommendations set up by the Foreign Affairs Committee. And I hope it will set out a clear strategy and most particularly, and, and I hope that this is something that Tom and I agree on because it was really made very clear in, in the report on the integrated review, that the recommendation that the government prioritize its mediation, conflict resolution and atrocity prevention capabilities. This must be central in whatever is published in, in January. But I'm a bit concerned because this wasn't something that I heard very much about in the Foreign Secretary's speech today in Parliament. The UK's commitment to conflict prevention, to pre preventing and confronting the gravest crimes, um, such as the genocide that is underway um, against the Uyghurs in China, such as the crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing and genocide that took place in 2017 against the Rakhine, uh, against the Rohingya in the Rakhine state of um, Myanmar. This must be um, embedded within the new FCDO structure alongside and joined up with the UK's human rights work, but also its work in trade and its other internationally facing work. And so for me, I suppose what I'd really like to emphasize now is that the UK's responsibility to help protect vulnerable populations from widespread discrimination and violence, such as the Rohingya in Rakhine and the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, must be a fundamental value of British policy. And while the UK has in the past been a strong rhetorical supporter of these goals, the integrated review and this opportunity of coming in the wake of flux that Tom so rightly emphasized must be the time for those commitments to be replicated and, and I really think embedded and integrated within national policy and as a matter of national interest. Because these global challenges that the UK must necessarily engage with, the crisis that the UK must necessarily help prevent calls for the implementation of values, not simply the expression of commitments. And whether we're talking about preventing mass atrocities or pandemics, any global challenge requires effort, resource and strategy, and it requires partners. And it's for that reason, not necessarily specifically because of the target, but that for, with so many friends and colleagues, and also I, I, I suppose some, some people that usually I profoundly disagree with, sort of listened in dismay to yesterday's announcement that the government is going to seek to cut the UK's aid budget at a time when it has never been more needed. And I understand that the pandemic has forced tough decisions, but it is wrong to say that it has forced a decision between domestic and international priorities because there is no such stark line. And I really agree with Tom here, tackling COVID, addressing climate change, promoting girls' education, 
These are priorities that benefit the UK too. And global problems, we know now, but it, it, it was always true, but it is certainly more true now than ever, require global solutions because we live in a rule-based rules -based burden sharing system. And it's because these problems impact those within UK borders. And very often they impact most specifically the most vulnerable in the UK, um, that, that we must have that connected approach. And COVID has underlined this fact, but COVID is not the exception. And so for me, we really need to change how we think about international policy in the UK. It isn't something foreign, but it is something that connects the UK to the world. And so it's not that our national interest should determine where the UK shares those burdens, but it is in the national interest to have a strategy that shows and determines how best we can do so. Um, I suppose I think I'll, I'll, I'll end there, but I'm really looking forward to, to questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Um, that's you're making some really important, powerful points, and it did sort of speak to what the Chancellor was saying yesterday in terms of that difficult um, dilemma that governments got in terms of messaging. Like I was struck by how he 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 sort of framed the difficult choice that he had to take with regards to cutting the aid target as acting in the interests of the British people. And it's obviously it's really you can see how, of course, at a time with such um, horrific economic data, so you know, high unemployment, growing unemployment, a real um, economic crisis at home. Um, it's very difficult for people to, to 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 make that pivot and think. I need to also help with my limited funds. Um, all the the world's poorest and neediest overseas, when there's so much need at home. But it's definitely it's a messaging issue, isn't it? As as much as anything, in terms of being able to say exactly as you put it that it's not a foreign domestic issue. The world is combined and what happens over there will come back and affect us unless we try to help shape it. So um, maybe then you can uh, tell people how, how government can do that. How can they make that difficult argument about the importance of, of, of defending these kind of values and investing in, um, in helping the world's poorest in order to help ourselves? Thanks very much, Deborah. Um, thanks, Tom and Kate, for your thoughts and insights. They're very thought-provoking. And, and thanks very much to the Foreign Policy Centre for uh, for hosting this event and indeed for inviting me to uh, to contribute to their uh, volume uh, that that sort of we're launching today. In effect, um, you know, I think I, I do I, I I do have to in a way sort of s start with the post-Brexit moment, because I think that that is part of the, the reason why the, 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 the sort of, uh, we're in a situation of flux. Um, and while perhaps there were fears that what we would see uh, after Brexit would be a UK that would be perhaps mainly sort of mercantile in its approach to its international relations, or indeed perhaps even turned inwards, um, there have been some really encouraging signs, I think, from this government that they do recognise the importance of, of values uh, and, and recognise those both as being intrinsically important um, uh, because they help to protect the interests of the UK, but also because they're important uh, as part of the way in which the UK has influence in the world, part of its soft power. Um, and that partly goes back to the point that Tom was making about the role that the UK played in creating the post Second World War architecture, including the human rights architecture that helps to sort of uh, delineate uh, the rights that everybody in the world uh, ought to enjoy, uh, including, uh, I think, respect for the rule of law and protection of democratic institutions. So it, it, if we sort of look at a rhetorical level, and I think even if we look at the area of practice, there are lots of positives. Um, you know, it, it is clear that in, in this particular foreign secretary, we do have somebody who in, 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 in Britain's role in the world, at least, is, is someone who believes in, in human rights, who makes it a priority. Um, the, 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 the continued leadership that the UK is showing in the multilateral system, particularly in the Human Rights Council. The UK will be a member again in January. 
I think is, you know, remains a, a very important manifestation of the UK's sort of diplomatic commitment to the protection of human rights internationally. Um, we've had obviously this year the, the, the creation of a human rights sanctions mechanism in the UK, which is a very important tool. Uh, one tool among many, but a very important tool as a way of focusing uh, on those people who are most responsible for gross human rights violations in a way that doesn't carry the risks and damage of more conventional sanctions mechanisms. Um, and we've also had some very positive uh, action by, by the UK uh, government uh, in respect of key crises uh, th th this year and last, including in, in Belarus, response to Belarus, where the UK has played a leadership role. Uh, and I think with some, with some, with some caveats also in, in respect of Hong Kong, at least in terms of the willingness of the UK to make the offer that it made to British overseas nationals and also the way in which the UK has, uh, has sought to kind of marshal international concern. And I think that that is starting to bear some fruit uh, in the multilateral context, although I, I, I do, and I think um, uh, Tom would agree, I do have some concerns about whether the, the UK is, is sort of running out of steam in its China policy when it comes to human rights. Um, but, I, but at the same time that there are those positives, I think that there are some real inconsistencies. And I, this comes back to the question um, that Kate was touching on about whether there is in fact a strategy um, or whether there are a series of sort of policies uh, that, are, that are a bit sort of situational. Um, I remember many, many years ago uh, talking to a, uh, a British official, this is in the uh, sort of early 90s, who worked for the UK mission in New York, who described human rights as a, as a tactic that he used in his diplomacy. I mean, I think we've come a long way from there, but at the same time, if the UK wants to be serious about giving effect to its intentions to try to promote human rights and the rule of law around the world in ways that are beneficial both for British people and also for uh, people around the world, then I think there are there is a need for a more strategic approach, a more joined up approach. And there are various ways in which uh, we see this inconsistency manifest. One is that the UK, as I said, is very often very good uh, when it comes to multilateral action, including leading other states to join in condemnation of gross human rights violations. But it doesn't always bring the same uh, seriousness of purpose in terms of a focus on human rights and its domestic relations. And I think that um, uh, Saudi Arabia would be a good example of that, notwithstanding the, 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 the human rights sanctions imposed on a number of Saudi officials over the murder of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Um, I think, as I, as I touched on, there is also a bit of a reluctance to, to kind of uh, have the courage of its convictions. I, you know, I think, I think on China, both on Hong Kong and Xinjiang, and indeed on Tibet, um, we see the UK uh, um, engaged um, and interested in, in, in mobilizing international action. But when it comes to actually uh, taking further steps beyond the ones that it's already taken, remarkably reluctant, whether it's creating a UN special mechanism, whether it's designating a Chinese officials for human rights sanctions. And that inevitably undercuts the effectiveness of the efforts that it's, that it's undertaking. I think there's also a problem around uh, the, granular, the, the sort of the granular reality of some of the thematic values and uh, um, priorities that the UK has. So if you take media freedom, for example, the UK uh, uh, chairs the Global Media Freedom Coalition uh, with Canada. Um, and it, it through that, it takes, you know, leads on some very important global initiatives. But if you sit down with Foreign, foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office officials um, to ask them to push for a jail journalist, you're often told, well, we can't really say anything in public about that, or it won't really be effective. And we, that, 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 you know, there isn't a sort of connection there between this grand idea of supporting media freedom and then the reality of what it actually means to stand up for journalists who are being persecuted for their work. 
And then the last one I want to mention is the issue of a consistency between foreign and domestic policy. I mean, we've 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 had, you know, a, a number of examples in the last um, in the last year or so, um, some of which, you know, may, may be may, may be the subject of disagreement. But I think if we take, for example, the internal market bill, um, and if we also take the decision to suspend Parliament, um, we have there something that, at the very least. Um, is very difficult to reconcile with the fact that the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office has just launched a global campaign to promote the rule of law around the world. And, you know, while domestic politics is immensely complicated, um, and I, I don't want to get into party pol political points, I do think that there needs to be a recognition that what the UK does at home matters to the credibility of its voice overseas. And, 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 and there needs to be a connection made between those areas of policy. And that's the reason why I think having a, 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 a human rights strategy that articulates the relationship between these different areas of policy across government departments would be a really important way of actually giving effect to the ambitions that the UK says that it has. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. That was, you made some very good points actually as well about, about um, the UK's Vo finding its voice really over the last year in terms of speaking out, especially with the, the Five Eyes partners, that seems to be a, a continuing theme. Um, now, thank you very much. People have been aren't putting up questions. Uh, I will attempt to go through the box. I will democratically go through uh, from the first person to type a question onwards. So I'll try and get through as many as possible. Um, in terms of the panel, if you want, do you want to just wave at me, because I can see all three of you. Um, in terms of who wants to answer the question. Um, is that all right? <laughs> uh, okay, so the first one is from Mark Grayling, and he asks, does the Mattis maxim, and I'm assuming he's referring to General Mattis, the former uh, American general, former defense secretary, um, does the Mattis maxim about reducing spending on aid and development mean having to buy more ammunition in the long run still apply and if so, is the cut in the UK aid budget not, uh, not a mistake and a false economy? Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, but uh, who cares what I think? Who would like to answer that one? You want me to, don't you, Deborah? Go on um, then, if you must. <laughs> Thank um, you. Why don't you pick the speakers rather than not just wave? I'm sure you'll pick much better than we will. The, um, look, I, I, I don't think it's a great plan. Um, because I think Britain should uh, exercise influence overseas. I think that's in our interest, and I think we should defend the things that matters. And, uh, and and what matters said was what you don't spend on aid, you spend on ammo, and he's got a point. But I also think it's worth putting this into context. I mean, the UK is still going to spend about £10 billion a year. That's more than France, Italy. Uh, you know, uh, it's up there with Japan and many other countries. And it's, you know, it's still 0.5, which is percentage wise more than anybody in the G7 except Germany. So, you know, I mean, this is this can be oversold. I think it is an error. I don't think it's a crime. Um, it's it's one of those things that I think is a policy decision rather than a moral decision. Uh, and I think it's one that I think we should be making differently. Um, but I do think that it's uh, it's not just up to Britain. Uh, to provide aid around the world. And there are many, many countries, uh, as you know very well, Deborah, uh, who are neither uh, defending themselves in military terms, nor are they supporting uh, others in uh, aid terms. And does Benjamin or Kate, would you like to chip in? Yes, Kate? Um, yeah, really, I, I think that, that this, this, this maxim, and, and I think Andrew Mitchell quoted it in, in the, the House earlier this week, um, it's really about prevention and that actually that, that when, when aid and, and development budgets are spent best, it is when you're investing in the prevention of crises, not just the very expensive, though urgently needed response to crises, whether they're humanitarian, whether they're kind of, uh, say, an, an earthquake or a sort of other kind of disaster. They are incredibly costly. But actually what the maxim is really getting at is that development done well prevents things from destabilizing to such an extent that you then sort of need to invest in sharper end security. And, and I really think that that's the point, irrespective of the numbers that we're talking about, whether in the defense budget or in the aid budget, that the new FCDO is really well placed, however the decision might have been made, to actually now join up the capacity for the UK's development expertise and capabilities, 
with the diplomatic toolkit. And they always sort of, when, it, when we were looking at um, assessing human rights policy in, in, in the UK over recent years, or approach to conflicts, approach to preventing these sorts of crises abroad, they were always a bit too disconnected because they fell in between the cracks of DFID and FCO. And so, you know, while I, I couldn't welcome the way in which the merger was announced, I do think that there was a real opportunity there. And I think that whatever comes out of the integrated review in January, and however the aid budget is spent, really it's that prevention first way of thinking to stop the sharp end um, response, um, it, it, which I think is what that sort of Mattis Maxim is, is really getting to, must be really integral because the prevention of terrible things is in the benefit to all of us and it saves money as well as lives. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to go to the third question, just because the second one is quite similar. Um, and this is from Audrey Wells, and she asks, what changes would you like to see China make in its Belt and Road policy to make it acceptable to you? And I think, Tom, that's probably one for you, because that was reflecting your comments on the Belt and Road initiative. Sure. I mean, look, the, the, the reality is what China is trying to do through its Belt and Road initiative is really what it's been doing domestically for the last 25 years. Uh, and um, it's an understandable policy. In order to develop markets, you need to develop the infrastructure around it, and then you uh, effectively uh, grow the economy in a local area in a way that is connected to Beijing. That is, I mean, that's pretty much uh, the policy of uh, the Chinese state, not just in the last 20 years, but actually in some ways in the last several thousand years. It's, it's an imperial model uh, with satrapies and, uh, and, uh, and colonial outposts. Um, and the challenge of it is, that it doesn't fundamentally recognize the sovereignty of the uh, of the nations or the areas in which it is engaged and that's why it's a challenge and so i do think that this is uh, a system that we need to um, be aware of at the very politest end of the spectrum uh, and and uh, and and address because uh, as we withdraw or should we withdraw from the international should we withdraw from supporting democratic states around the world or, or countries that are on the cusp of democracy around the world it's not that they will sort of stay neutral it's that there is another competing uh, force that is seeking to, uh, to gain influence over them and and, uh, and and benefit from that relationship um i've got one for you benjamin um this is from an anonymous attendee and they ask how will developing countries, especially Latin America, be affected with the reduction of the UK's international aid budget? Right. Well, I, I have to sort of begin my response by saying that I'm not an I'm not an expert in in aid and development policy. I'm, I've been working in the field of human rights and human rights law for most of my professional life, so I I, I won't be able to give a deep answer to that question. Um, I I'm just think, trying to make you not feel left out. It's, it's absolutely fine. I mean, look, I I think what what I what I can say regarding the sort of wider point about the cuts is it's worth recognizing that you know part of the reason why um, the UK's aid is so effective is because it's predictable. We know what the UK is going to be able to spend in three, five, ten years time, and that helps to. Um, that helps to 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 um, sorry about that. That helps to to um, people to be able to plan and to collaborate with the UK. The UK um, uh, ha also has an incredibly uh, good reputation for the quality of its programming um, and is able to sort of attract the best people. And I think there would there is there is a worry that this may be if this is seen as a permanent shift away and a sort of deprioritization that that could affect um, the, the UK's sort of leadership role in the sector in a way that would be to the detriment, not only of you know, the effectiveness of UK aid policy, but, but the sector as a whole. I think the other thing on, on Kate's point about the, um, the, the, the merger of, FC, of the Foreign Office and, and DFID, um, I know that there've been a lot of concerns about it. I do think from a human rights point of view, there is a potential benefit, which is that it allows for the integration <laughs> Of a policy approach between the um, between the different uh, areas of UK policy, and certainly, you know, where we have an historical context where the where the UK's aid spend dwarfs the other spending that it has in in, in particular countries, um, having a situation now where the ambassador is in charge of everything that's happening in the country 
does offer the potential for a more integrated approach where we don't, for example, have a country which is a human rights priority country where we're nevertheless giving enormous amounts of you know, untied aid to the government. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, so the next question is from Sophie Robinson and it's directed at Tom. Um, uh, thanking you for your insights and then asking uh, again, and a lot of these questions unsurprisingly are about um, overseas aid and the reduction to the budget, or re reduction to the target, sorry. And um, Sophie asks, um, even if this reduction um, in the commitment to 0.5% is a short-term measure, do you think it will cause long-term damage to the UK's international reputation and in the eyes of the, U the new US Biden administration? Tom, that's one for you. Um, not necessarily is the answer to that. It depends how we handle it. Um, you know, as I say, we're still one of the largest aid donors in the world. And if we maintain the commitment, as Ben says quite correctly, uh, one of the great strengths is not the absolute uh, amount of money, but the fact that it's predictable. And so, so long as the uh, the government sticks to a predictable uh, sum and, and, and actually focuses on many areas that, uh, you know, we've set out already and the Foreign Secretary reiterated today, then there's no reason why we shouldn't uh, remain a very important partner in the long term you know we still are and, and we will remain one of the largest contributor to contributors to multilateral organizations like the world health organization where we're the third biggest donor uh, you know there are an awful lot of areas where frankly the, the uk just simply is a very very large international aid partner to the united states and so i don't see any a great reason why this should uh, particularly damage the relationship with the United, Na United States. Uh, but of course, you know, as with everything, it depends how you handle it. Um, and there's another question, I'm sorry, it's for you as well, um, from um, Laurie Lee, who asks again about aid um, and makes an interesting point about how um, that there's research that the self-interest argument actually turns the public off aid because they think the whole point of aid is to help the poorest people in the world, period. Um, however much they feel we should spend, that's what they think it should be spent on. Um, what do you say to that? Um, I haven't seen that research. It's not my experience, but then, you know, my experience is of speaking to people uh, in uh, forums around uh, the UK and political forums. So, you know, I, I'm not going to tell you my, my experience is right and that research is wrong. I don't know. But I, I do think people like to know that um, they are not only doing the right thing, but that the right thing is in their interest. And I don't see, I don't see a conflict between that. And again, sorry, again for you, um, Paul Flather, uh, and I apologise if I pronounce people's names incorrectly, is asking, and these things keep bouncing around my screen, so sorry about that. Um, where would Mr. Tugendhat draw the line in the sand with China, given we desperately need trading links and yet oppose human rights violations? Perhaps the, di perhaps the dice is thrown in our stance on Hong Kong, which has now gone quite quiet, or will it only when the Taiwan status is threatened as it surely will? Uh, I think he's basically saying, uh, where would you draw the line with China? Well, uh, it's, it's um, you know, we've got to look at it case by case. I mean, I think we were very clear on Hong Kong. It's taken me about a year and a bit to get uh, the British government to recognise its responsibilities towards British nationals overseas. I'm glad that the Foreign Secretary has finally done that, the Home Secretary has finally done that. Those are two things I'm very pleased about. Um, and I, now I think that the UK government should be calling out, and uh, Ben has heard me speaking about this, and so is Kate, forgive me for boring you both, but about the human rights violations, uh, not just in Xinjiang, but in Tibet and Mongolia, and uh, the responses that we should have. But I also think that we should be calling out China on its environmental policy. Uh, you know, the fact that China is building uh, coal powered, coal powered uh, sorry, coal power stations. Uh, at a greater rate than I think anyone else in the world at the moment, is hugely damaging. Uh, and I think it's very important that we uh, make sure that we, uh, you know, work with others to, 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 to shape the, the, the impact of this. And that may mean things like carbon pricing, because if all we're doing, after all, is offshoring jobs and carbon footprint to a country that's willing to pollute more than we are, then we should uh, price that into the product of goods and services. Um, so there's an interesting question from um, Christoph Watts, and if Kate or Ben want to jump, want to answer uh, and give Tom a break, please let me know, because um, it's not directed at anyone in particular. And and he asks, he says that I think you've missed, you, I think you've minimised the role of money and finance in the new world order, 
the IT revolution has increased the importance of capital mobility in either embedded technology or flows of money. So my question is, uh, my question, is the central role of London in the rulemaking of the US, the EU, China and Russia likely to be weaker after Brexit? Is London more important than the UK and how integrated are um, Great Britain and London? Who would like to answer that one? Come on now. I'm, I'm happy to do it if you want. But yeah, go on, please. Thank you. All right. Look, I think I think uh, Christoph's absolutely right. First of all, I think one of the biggest uh, challenges that we've got in the international system at the moment is not uh, Belt and Road, but Alipay. Uh, Alipay is internationalising the electronic renminbi or an electronic version of the renminbi uh, in parts of Southeast Asia at a rate that simply is unforeseen um, only a few years ago, and challenging the SWIFT dollar-based system. Uh, and therefore the ability of the US Federal Reserve to have influence through sanctions and various other things. Look, we're not there yet, but this is a very, very big change. And the second point that uh, Christoph highlights is the, the internationalization or rather the centralization of uh, tech finance into very small hands and therefore the ability for uh, effectively rent capture to be done at a global scale in a way that simply wasn't possible even 20 or 30 years ago. You know, the idea that one person could uh, control uh, the interactions of one to two billion people would have been unimaginable 20, 30 years ago or even five years ago. And yet that is exactly what Mark Zuckerberg is doing. And so the understanding of finance and uh, control in both those senses and the change of technology in that is hugely important. And this is where it looks. I mean, I think he's right about, I think, Christoph, you're right about uh, the challenge of uh, London. Uh, you know, the relationship between London and GB. I mean, it was ever thus to a certain extent, but uh, but it, it has certainly has become more so. Thank you. Um, so this is the question for Kate, um, and it's from Matthew Saville. And he asks, if the UK is going to put values and rules at the heart of its international approach, does it need to practically reevaluate its relationships with those countries which do not support liberal democracy or act against those values? Um, and then specifically for you as well, well, that was, that's a general question, but I thought you'd be a good person to answer it. And then um, specifically directed at you, um, is there a risk that more activism equates to more interventionism? Thanks, that's a really good one. I just wanted to tag on to the end of, of the, the last question, that, that point around underestimating the importance of kind of finance tech and financial flows I mean not at all I, th I think it really must be a part of a joined up human rights strategy and for too long I think and and this is not just to um, bash government I think it's the same for human rights advocates and experts too that we have not done enough to join up the need to integrate human rights principles and practice within those spaces as well. And so whether we're talking about what Mark Zuckerberg is doing on Facebook or whether it's about tracking financial flows, that is where a lot of the kind of future frontiers of human rights will be best delivered. And actually that stuff is not necessarily that expensive to do. It requires like political pri prioritization, expertise, analysis, and then some political will. And actually it is much cheaper than a lot of the kind of delivery work. So I hope that that is something that will, will be thought about at the moment, um, sort of both as part of the integrated review and going further. That, that question around will, will sort of a more, more, whether you call it activism or sort of a, a prioritization of human rights lead to more interventionism. I mean, if, if done right, no, it, it should, what it should lead to is more consistency. And it should lead to more consistency domestically. Um, it should, and between sort of what you are promoting beyond your borders and what, what the UK is upholding at home, it should, it should encourage and, and, and support more consistency um, across departments. And, and I actually do think that UK government has, has made some really important strides to um, thinking about more cross-cutting joined up approaches to global challenges. Um, I think the organized crime strategy is a really fantastic example, except it doesn't currently have one for other global challenges. And anyone um, who knows anything about the work that I do is sort of, I, I've been really 
calling for um, the need for a joined up atrocity prevention strategy that can connect the different contributions that those different departments can make to ensure that actually integrating those commitments to human rights are done consistently. And finally, it would, it would encourage consistency um, across how the UK deals with various different states. And so looking at those discrepancies between how the UK treats perhaps some of its friends on certain human rights issues and how it treats some of those that it considers to be far less friendly. And, and so I think that actually we shouldn't necessarily look at the, the concerns from a perspective of more interventionism, but rather consistency would actually mean that decisions were being made from the perspective of how can lives better be saved, how can crises better be averted, and, and, and that should inform decision making um, rather than anything else. Thank you. Yeah, I can just come in on that as well if I can. If that's yeah, right. great. Um, Yes, I mean, I do. I do think it's very important to, uh, to to sort of underscore that having a having an approach to foreign policy that is sort of informed by values doesn't mean uh, you you can't pursue other interests, whether those are commercial or trade or you know or or, or, or military or otherwise. It just means that, as as Kate was saying, you take a you take a consistent approach, and that you actually are serious about emphasizing the importance of human rights in your relationships with your friends as well as with other states you know and it's been very interesting actually to hear some of the uh, uh some of what the by the the biden transitional team have been talking about around saudi arabia and around the fact that perhaps the time has come to rethink the way in which the us ha you know uh, uh relates to saudi arabia because effectively we're this the, the MBS um, is, is exercising such a kind of malign influence and that the, the, the human rights situation there is so grave, notwithstanding, you know, a few signature reforms, that kind of business as usual, and of course, not even, not even to get into Yemen, business as usual is just not going to work. So I think that there is a case for, for doing that, actually. Thank you. Um, so this is a question for all three panellists, um, so if you all want to get thinking, it's a, a good question from Keith Best, and um, he asks, from the time of the Gulf War and previously, the UK's role has been seen to be complementary to that of the USA, uh, which has, um, to some, added greater security and to others a danger of the UK being partisan. Do the panel see this relationship of the UK as a junior partner to the USA continuing? Or is the role of a new global Britain outside the EU to be more an honest broker on issues such as Iran? And how can we do that when we no longer have the military or economic clout of yesteryear? So, um, ben, Benjamin, do you want to go first on that one? As you're kind of... Uh, sure, I'm happy to do that. Yes, I mean, look, the UK has an incredible uh, diplomatic network and it has, it, it has real soft power it has a real credibility on uh, the idea of a sort of values-based approach. It also, I think, still has great credibility around its uh, military and intelligence capabilities, uh, peacekeeping and otherwise. So um, the UK is, I think, certainly capable of sort of, you know, going it alone uh, in terms of a leadership position obviously in order to be effective it needs to collaborate with others i very much hope that the uk will continue to work closely with european allies european states not only on a bilateral basis but also with the with the bloc um i mean uh, working with the five eyes is great and i don't i don't dis disagree with it but i but it, I, it, I worry sometimes that there's a sense that we now only work with the five eyes and we don't work with it with our with our european partners anymore and that can't be right so I think with the US, you know, the last four years have shown that um, we, we, we do have to have, we do have to have an independent approach. And actually there will often be issues, and Iran is a good example, where we're going to have more in common with France and Germany than we might with Washington. And, and, uh, and so I think that the, the, the best approach is to think about building kind of coalitions of the willing um, that share values, and that can help to amplify the efforts that the UK wants to undertake. Um, Kate, do you want to 
step in and give your thoughts? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, I agree with, with, with everything that, that Ben just, just said. Really, I, I, th I think all I'll, I'll, I'll add to it is, is maybe to go back to um, and jump from something that Tom said in, in his opening remarks of this moment with the new incoming administration, the multilateral system, the rules-based system, the human rights agenda has really taken a bit of a beating in the last few years. And anyone who works in human rights did not go to an event before COVID hit where someone said that the UN system was facing the biggest crisis since you know uh, it was founded now of course it is actually facing the biggest crisis since it was founded but it's a slightly different one and within covid and with a new incoming administration there is actually an opportunity to kind of redress some of those imbalances that have fundamentally kind of held back the development of, of the United Nations that have made it a little bit unequal. And if the UK doesn't play a leading role in that development as a permanent member of the Security Council and with its special relationship with the United States, then I think that that would be a great, great error, both for the United Nations, the world system, but, but also for the, for the UK. Thank you. And Tom, do you want to share some thoughts on that point? Very briefly, I mean, look, I, I, I broadly speaking agree with Ben and Kate. I mean, the, the reality is that the, the reason for the partnership with the United States is uh, is because, broadly speaking, we see the world in relatively similar ways, not identical, but relatively similar. We, we do believe in the rule of law. We do believe in a certain internationalism and a certain willingness to take action. And, and once you accept those sort of three principles, um, it does sort of narrow the field rather uh, dramatically. Um, and though, you know, people uh, quite often comment on the, uh, the change in Britain's relative power, and of course that's certainly true, uh, you know, Britain is still relatively one of the top five militaries in the world. It's still relatively uh, one of the top five uh, intelligence networks in the world and still relatively one of the top uh, five, six, seven economies in the world. So, you know, it's certainly true that leaving the European Union has changed uh, things and, and will continue to do so. But the idea that this leaves Britain naked and alone is, I'm afraid, just not true. Thank you. Um, so I've got a, an interesting question here from, and I'm not going to try and pronounce your surname, I'm sorry, Marcus, um, but he says he cards on the table, he works for the International Committee of the Red Cross in the UK. And it's a question um, related to the Overseas Operations Bill, um, which is going through Parliament. And it's you know, designed to protect British troops in overseas conflicts from ve vexatious litigation um, and repeat investigations. I mean, you, you all know the, the arguments um, and how um, there are there are those that, um, you know, that this bill it could that think that say that this bill is undermining the UK's stance on its intention to lead by example when it comes to compliance to the laws of armed conflict and uh, maybe make it harder to prosecute British troops for um, serious Geneva Convention crimes by legislating for this um, presumption against prosecution after five years. Do you agree with that reading? Um, uh, and, and, and is there a risk that the bill puts into question the international criminal court system that the UK helped to build? Um, maybe Tom, if you want to take that one first. I'm uh, very happy to. I'm, I'm going to have to go in a few moments. So I'm very happy to, to address this one. Uh, the answer is no, it doesn't. You know, the law against torture is still covered by uh, the Criminal Justice Act. I think it's 1982 or 84, I can't remember, uh, which is in Queen's regulations. It is absolutely clear that there is no uh, excuse for torture at all. Uh, the, uh, you know, there is a, there is a, uh, there is a presumption against prosecution of after five years from when you have heard about the case. So if you didn't hear about the case for, or the incident for 15 years, then the five years starts at the 15 year point. It doesn't start you know, when the incident happened. So it's not, as though, uh, it, it's not as though it's stopping anybody bringing a charge. All it's doing is meaning that if you have been investigated, if you have heard about it and you are not, have not been prosecuted after five years, then you can reasonably expect to get on with your life. Now, if new evidence comes to light, if something changes, if the situation is different, then you go back to the start again. I mean, frankly, you know, the, the main criticism of the Overseas Operation Bill is that it doesn't actually do very much. Uh, it does a little bit, but it doesn't do very much. And, and the idea that in any way it gives any form of immunity to anyone, I'm afraid it is simply not true. It doesn't. 
Um, and so are you, do you have to, to shoot off or have you got time I, to- No, I've, I've got to shoot off, forgive me. I'm supposed to be on okay. doing something else in a moment. Well, thank you very much for taking part. Um, if, well, I think we've got some more questions. I'll ca carry on with the other two panelists until 6.30, if that's okay. Um, there's um, a question here from um, oh, Robert sorry, Moore. Do you mind if I also spoke to that? Uh, oh, sure, it, yes, please do. Yeah, that's okay. It's something that uh, Human Rights Watch has done quite a bit of work on. Obviously, I would have preferred if Tom had been here to hear it, but anyway. Um, so, I mean, you, you may not be surprised to know we have a very different view. Um, we, we, we do see this as, as a very impossible, really, to square with the UK's international obligations. It also, I think, you know, there's a real concern among... Uh, among groups working for veterans, that it will actually make it harder for veterans to bring claims against the military. And that what it actually does is immunize the Ministry of Defense rather than immunize soldiers. Um, it also, I think, creates a risk actually that, uh, that, that actions will end up in the International Criminal Court. That the principle by which the International Criminal Court works is that um, if a case is prosecuted in the, in the domestic courts, there's no need for the International Criminal Court to get involved. But if cases are not being dealt with, it actually increases the likelihood. So, um, you know, it, 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 it's really and, and then on the issue of vexatious prosecutions, which is the sort of stated justification for the legislation. Um, the reality is, is that there are mechanisms within the regulatory systems of the legal profession for dealing with lawyers who bring such claims. One lawyer has already been struck off for that. Um, this is not necessary in order to deal with that issue but but what it is going to do i, I fear is um make it even harder to uh to bring justice for people who are the victims of crimes by uh, uk service personnel make it harder as i said for british personnel who are injured uh to bring claims against the uk government and it will damage the british the british uh government britain's reputation in the world unfortunately i mean the uk at the moment is uh, campaigning to have a judge elected to the International Criminal Court. So you can imagine there'll be some raised eyebrows in, in ministries of justice and ministries of foreign affairs around the world, while the UK is doing that on the one hand, and then on the other hand, trying to pass this legislation at home. Oh, that's a good point. Um, do you think that might actually be detrimental to the UK's ambition to have a judge on the ICC? Undoubtedly, undoubtedly, because it, it calls into question its commitment to international criminal justice. But is, aren't you sympathetic, though, to the, um, the you know the plight of of soldiers who do face? Well, on the one hand, there's the I, I hear what you say about how there are mechanisms in place to um, prevent or to, to to limit the impact of vexatious claims. But isn't isn't the the more fundamental point behind that in terms of the MOD thinking that it's the concern about lawfare, the concern about the use of vexatious litigation that's actually impacting decisions on the battlefield, decisions taken in the heat of battle, uh, commanders not wanting to take the risks that maybe they need to to win because they're worried about vexatious right. lawsuits. And that's why they need this litigation to protect them and to ensure they can fight more freely and, uh, you know, and win. I know. I think the difficulty is that these cases tend not to arise in out of uh, uh, battle. They tend to arise more out of situations of treatment of prisoners you know, uh, or, or, or indeed situations where people have been captured. Um, the most, you know, the, the, the case that was the subject of, a, of an inquiry, the, 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 the killing of the hotel receptionist Baha Musa in Iraq, that, that was a case about somebody who was, in, who was in custody and was effectively beaten to death in custody. And Can I just... one, one person got, got, got a, a low, lav low ranking soldier, got a year suspended for that crime nobody at no officers were ever held to account for that that's the problem that's, do you mind if i just jump jump in here because i just think that it, it's such an important example of so much that we've been talking about this evening and, and it is it's a shame that um tom had to to jump off but i am actually sure he's heard both ben and i say it before <laughs> Um, but, but this point of consistency, the UK does such important work training troops around the world to meet the standards, you know, legal standards of war in preventing violations. And, and if, if, if the UK troops are not held to those same standards that they are training others abroad, I do not understand how the UK as a nation can, can expect 
other other states to, to, to change their, their regulations, their monitoring, their training, their standards. And, and so just on a base level of consistency and, and respect as, as a tool in order to kind of get the work done that, that the UK um, seeks to do in, in those really, really important training and, and reducing the violations of, of war, uh, it, it, it simply can't stand. Although it does, you know, the, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm going to sort of, but I do, you know, I do, I do follow this very, I am following this very closely, but isn't it the case that it's not a question of, of, uh, of reducing um, compliance to, you know, Geneva Conventions and law of war and human rights, it's more about, like, you know, protecting against the vexatious claims, that's, so it's not reducing anything, it's just making sure that soldiers aren't going to be caught up in this litigation. Isn't that that's the, the crux of it, though, isn't it? The difficulty is, though, that you can only have a you can only have a credible system of international humanitarian law if you have enforcement for breaches. If you don't have enforcement for breaches, then there's then, then it's not a credible system because then it's simply it's simply an option. And, uh, you know, and the reality is the UK's record of holding uh, its military personnel to account when they're involved in grave breaches of the of humanitarian law is very, very poor. I mean, and, and, you know, you may have seen the Panorama programme from last year that showed that there, there'd been an active cover up and, in, and an active interference with it, with military investigations in the UK. I really think that, that, that those are the things that we need to be focused on. Um, because, because as Kate said, the UK is actually, I mean, the UK was, was instrumental in the development of international humanitarian law. And, and as Kate says, the UK actually is still very much involved in training soldiers around the world in, in compliance in it. And our, our credibility on that, as well as on, as a leader in international criminal justice, international accountability, our role in the International Criminal Court, our support for the establishment of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda and so on, the special court in Sierra Leone, all of those things, um, depend on us being seen to be willing to hold ourselves to the same standards and and unfortunately this looks very much like an effort to to avoid accountability um yeah no, like you say it's a shame that tom wasn't trying to hear but uh, we're kind of running out of time but i'll do one last question um which um maybe you both might like to respond to and it's from um lewis from safer world and um the question is does the uk treat its allies and its rivals differently on human rights abuses uh, undermining democracy and stoking conflict? And is there a threat to our values and our national interests? Which is an interesting question. Um, who would like to go first? I'll, I'll take a go first, I, because I think I, I feel like um, almost every answer I've said has been about consistency. <laughs> um, and I mean, the, the, the simple answer is, is yes, they are treated differently. Um, and, and perhaps I'll, I'll, I will I, I don't want to sound like you know, sort of naive coming from the human rights perspective up, up to a point that is to be expected, but that is not what a human rights framework um, should encourage. A human rights framework should be there to guard against that kind of um, discrepancy. And I, I hope that it is, it is something that, that, again, this merger can, can encourage, then that embedding human rights in a much more active way and embedding it much more um, across um, the diplomatic and development functions rather than a sort of odd standalone space um, will, 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 will help bring that consistency. Um, but, but, but absolutely, they are, they, are, they are treated differently. And I think that in an effort to maybe sort of just say one, one final point before we close this, this, this event, we're living through this period of real flux and, and this year and this lot, these last few years have really, I think, made evident what was always the case, that those um, champions of human rights in the global north, and so, so countries like the UK, so not just the UK, but countries that, that it considers of, often to be like-minded, um, and so other in Europe and in, in the US, um, we have really seen a quite rapid backsliding of some of those standards um, around human rights and, and, and democracy that have previously been, been more usually attributed to, to, to countries outside of the global north, especially they have been attributed by um, those within the UK and the, the, the US and, and Europe. And I feel like we are at this moment where if COVID can teach us one thing and the last few years and the Trump administration can teach us one thing, it is that 
uh, all societies and states must guard against um, those sort of darker forces of democratic backsliding, of divisionism, of exclusion, um, of, of the, the um, un unraveling of systems and resilience that makes human rights violations more usual. And if you can start with that premise, then you can recognize that in treating all states, you have to have a human rights framework because all states require one. Um, I, I'm not necessarily expecting that to be front and center of, of the integrated review in the new year, but it's certainly something that um, protection approaches will be calling for um, in, in, in the, the near and long future. Thank you. And Benjamin, do you, do you have like one final comment to make before we wrap up? Very much agree with that. Um, and if you're if if uh, people are interested in sort of examples and elaboration of the lack of consistency, I would I would encourage them to read my essay in the Foreign Policy Centre uh, collection on uh, on on values in UK foreign policy, which which kind of elaborates that exact point. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm sorry I couldn't get through everybody's questions, but thank you for sending so many um, thought provoking ones. And thank you to the panelists for your fantastic interventions. And yeah, bring on the new year and we can find out what Dominic Raab means when he says that Britain's going to be a force for good in the world. Absolutely. Thank you. And thanks so much for hosting, Deborah. My pleasure. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks very much. Thank so much for hosting. And thanks for participating, Ben and Kate. Take care. Thanks a lot. Bye.